Well, <clears throat> I have the great pleasure um, to introduce a local and national um, renowned chef, Sat Baines. Um, Sat's joining us before he heads back to his restaurant um, to get ready for service tonight. So um, Sat runs a two uh, Michelin star restaurant here in Nottingham. Um, the, we've asked for questions in advance, so I have a list of questions. That doesn't mean that there won't be an opportunity for you to ask questions, and I'll, I've got a roaming mic I can come round with. Um, but to start with, Sat is going to give us a little introduction about himself. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Sat. Thank you. Hello, good morning, everybody. So my name's Sat, I think the instruction says it all in terms of don't want to bore you with my long uh, 35 years in a white box with a white jacket on as a chef. But I've been very fortunate to have been a chef from a, a very early age, from the age of 16. Uh, worked, not really fell in love with food initially, it was more of a get out my dad's shop kind of scenario. Dad came over from Punjab in the 60s, so we're part of the Commonwealth, good or bad. Um, he had to come and work. My grandfather came before him. He sent him a, a ship. They came over on a ship, took six weeks, and he came over when he was 14, 16 years old. And he worked in a foundry. He worked in a, a different establishments. Then he got his own shop. And then that, for a young kid from an Asian background, Punjabi background, there's four of us, three sisters and me. As the son, you've got to work like a donkey, and that's the facts. Because and you don't get paid, by the way. So I might do a backdated paycheck for one day for him. But uh, I think that what taught me was um, a work ethic. Uh, started working in the shop at 13. Uh, I used to do paper rounds, do cash and carry runs. So you're forced to almost have a life at school. Academia is really big in Asian communities, but I think also working for your family was also quite big because we were close knit. My dad had four brothers, all lived in Derby, where we were born, and we all kind of had a community together. So it was very close knit, and uh, we all stuck together. So working early age, great work ethic. Uh, dad bought me a bike one Christmas. I'm very happy. I was 14, 15. Then he told me that um, he'd sacked three paper lads, so I've now got there around, hence why he bought me the bike. So with the good came also the work ethic. So worked in the shop till I was 16, went to college, did 706, one and two, which is City and Gills, went to Derby, Will Morton, which is no longer there. I had a fantastic time, loved the whole discipline of working for Swiss and French trained chefs, starch whites, tall hats, neckerchief, polished shoes. So surreal to my life growing up. And I thought, you know, I like this. And also there was lots of girls on the course, which was even a, a, more of a bonus. And then I uh, did two years there. And also as I was working at college, as I was doing college, I also got a part-time job in a hotel in Derby um, as a commie chef or, or an apprentice. And I found there was another world out there not just based around working in shops and the rest of it. And I kind of wanted to go that way more because it meant I had to do less work in the shop. So it was brilliant. So realised that I was a night owl, realised that there was a subculture to catering. There was people after work, go for a drink, have a cigarette. I just loved the whole kind of nightlife of, of working in kitchens. I uh, met my wife when I was 17, 18 in Derby. Uh, she was a girlfriend at the time, and mum and dad found out. And my sister turned up to the restaurant with two black bin liners full of clothes and said they never want to see you again because she was white. And that's probably the best thing they ever did. So we're still together, Amanda, been 33 years. And she's obviously a, a driving force in her own right that uh, keeps me on the, the straight and narrow. Um, to cut it, long story short, I was still probably dossing around a bit. I wasn't really serious. I worked at Punchinello's in Nottingham, I don't know if you all know it. I worked at the Freemasons on uh, Goldsmith Street, which was a very strange experience when you have to serve food to a dummy. I don't know if any of you are Freemasons here, but what the hell are you lot doing? And it's, uh, it's just the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And then I did two years there, went on to uh, Punchinello's, got sacked because I was really rubbish and still dosed around, didn't really take it serious. Then a kind of epiphany came. There was a chap called Maddock Bellamy who was a... Um, owner, the son of the owner of Punchinella's, and he said to me, you know, Sat, have you ever thought of a five-year plan? I think I was 21, 22. Five-year plan, a 10-year plan. I goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, write it down. Just write it down. Where do you want to be in five years? 
And where do you want to be in 10 years? And in five years' time, I thought, you know, I want to be a chef. I want to have worked with some named chefs. I want to... So I wrote that down. And goes, if you're not on track, put yourself back on track. Because it's a really good kind of lesson. And I've used that ever since. And unfortunately, Mel had died a few years ago. And I never... And I got to say thank you a few years ago. But I saw him out of the blue. So I mentioned it to him. And he couldn't remember saying it to me. How, how amazing is that? One of them passing gestures that you just pass on. But I say it to all my guys. I say it to the guys I meet. I say it to all my chefs, five-year, ten-year plan, then do another one, and then keep on track. Every year, assess it, every six months. And if you're on track, that means you're, uh, you're on the right path to where you want to be. Um, fortunate enough, in 1999, I entered the Roos Scholarship. I was working in an art gallery in uh, Derbyshire, in Ashbourne. And in between the regional final and the final, the restaurant closed, so I was out of work. So again, lots of weird things happen to you and I think they happen to you for a reason they happen to build your character build a nice layer of rhino skin because it's what we need in this trade and also to give you resilience and also to not to think oh it's you know where is me it's about okay that's that's happening I've still got this chance to win this competition I'm the underdog but it's going to change your life so I put all the effort I could into the the competition I made sure it was on beautiful paper I sent off the a, a submission for the recipe got through to the regionals the restaurant closed I remember the owners coming around to the house in Nottingham saying, you know, we're not going to open next week. And I was like, well, you know, we're, in, we're screwed. We had a mortgage. We were 24, 25 years old. Amanda was working at the Gateway Hotel as the assistant manager there. So we thought, OK, we've got to be focused now. So I went into the final at Four Seasons Hotel in London. Um, there were chefs from Gordon Ramsay's from all over Michelin star restaurant background. I had none. And I just thought, I've just got to cook the best I can today. Because that's all you're judged on, is the day. It's not going to be who you are, what your background is, what your pedigree is, or how you're going to perform on the day. So I went with it. I'm, we had rack of lamb, saucheron, which is a, a hollandaise-based sauce, pomzana with an artichoke garnish. And I just remember in my head thinking, well, if you're one of nine judges, you're only going to taste a fraction of that dish. So I made sure I seasoned everything. I made sure I seasoned it. I rested the lamb. I French trimmed it, roasted it on the pomzana, carved it, it was beautiful and pink, seasoned it, <clears throat> each exposed area of it. And I remember going into the room afterwards and, and looking at my dish and it was just butchered, like <clears throat> hardly anything left, <clears throat> excuse me. And I thought, that, you know, that's really weird, why is mine such a mess? And there was a journalist there from the catering, she goes, well, doesn't that tell you anything? And I goes, no, it just means that these judges are quite scruffy. That's what I thought. So obviously being quite naive. Um, I remember later on that day, we were waiting for the, the announcement <clears throat> and uh, Mossman, one of the uh, legends of the industry, walks over to a few of us and just said, congratulations to us all. To get this far is a massive achievement. But that wasn't, that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to win. So yeah, thank you, chef. Massive honour. But um, the chefs I thought were first and second had done really well. So... In my head, I kind of knew who was going to win. But I just remember sitting in the front row, similar to this, big audience. A bit bigger than this, sorry. The audience was. It's about 400 people. So I remember sitting there, just put my head in my hands where I had a tall hat on. And I just, just say my name. Because they said the runner-up, who I thought was going to win. And then they said, the winner is. And I just said, say my name, say my name, say my name. And Michelle Rue, senior, all right, you know, rest his skull said my name and I just threw my hat and I was like, what the hell? And my wife screaming in the background with a friend and I, and I won and I won the Rue Scholarship and that changed my life. And I already was out of work. So this was the catalyst of, okay, what can you get? What opportunity have I got now? Knowing these opportunities don't come around often. To be a Rue Scholar is one of the most revered scholarships in the world. You get to work in any three-star restaurant in the world of your choice. So I chose the south of France, but in the meantime, I got a phone call from an agent to a new restaurant, um, an old restaurant that a new owner had taken over, and it was Hotel de Clos, which is on Lenton Lane. And the owner was John Abbey, he'd gone under in receivership, so the new receivers had took over, and uh, they sold it to a family from Birmingham. And the son used to work there as a student when he was at Knox Uni. So he found out that I'd won the scholarship. I was from Nottingham, I was out of work. Long story short, they approached me. And I said, well, I need to go to France for three months because that's where I want to take my three months stage. But 
I need to go before I start here. So we came to an agreement. They paid for three months worth of salary so I could pay my mortgage. And I went to Montpellier um, to work in a three-star restaurant, which was phenomenal. <clears throat> came back in October the 5th, 1999, took over the helm of Hotel de Clos, which is now Restaurant St. Baines, and I've been there 23 years. Within that time, I've seen lots of amazing chefs, staff, front of house sommeliers, managers walk through the doors and go on to conquer their industry. And it gives me and Amanda so much pride to know they've come from a stable. And I've always said that I'm not, I'm not the reason they are successful, they are. I've just helped them. And I think it's crucial to, set, to make sure that they realise that they have put in all the hard work. I've just shown them a direction. When I won the Rue Scholarship, I remember saying a quote, and I still stick to it. It's like, the Rue, the Rue Scholarship will show you a door, but you've got to walk through the door and then become that person you want to after that. So the restaurant itself has been established now under our, um, since 2005, when we took it over. Um, the restaurant's won many awards, which is down to the team and, and obviously the effort everyone puts in. We went to two Michelin stars in 2013, 2012, which is a massive achievement for any, any restaurant. And it's something that we don't pay too much attention to because it's about today. Going back to that, winning the, the, the scholarship, <clears throat> it just matters today. So it's all right if one of you came for a meal today, the restaurant's got two stars, we're sitting on our laurels, everything's easy. You then goes, actually, it was all right. You know, it, was, it was not amazing, but my argument is, well, You've got to prove that every day, every service, lunch and dinner, <clears throat> and breakfast as well. So it's not something we take lightheartedly, but I don't want to bog down the team with, we're supposed to be two stars, is that two stars? I'm sorry about this, Mark, can you hear it? <clears throat> but I keep saying, it can't define us, but it's got to be a standard that we don't go below. And none of us know what one, two or three stars are. are. So if you say to me, what is a two star restaurant? I've got no idea. No idea what it is. All I know is that the inspectors come, they judge you, they judge the food, and also the terminology of Michelin-starred chef is, doesn't really exist. There's no such thing as a Michelin-starred chef. It was a PR stunt by one of Marco's PR guys. Um, I think his name was Alan Bompton. Um, he's got a triple barrel name. And he coined the phrase Michelin-starred chef back in the late 80s, early 90s. So the restaurant... The stars are allocated to the food, nothing else. So when it's the food you serve in that restaurant is either one, two or three star level. So that means if I left and the food was still being served at a high level, the restaurant will still have two stars for the food. So there's a lot of misunderstanding with the whole Michelin guide of, you know, you can go and have, I know chefs that used to have stars in restaurants and they no longer have it, but they're still classed as a two star chef, but they're not cooking. So none of it, you know, when you think about it, it's a great PR and it's a great kudos to be named that, but it doesn't actually exist. So moving forward, we've obviously got the restaurant in 2015, looking at the industry, looking at how the industry has changed. I've been very fortunate to be in it in such a long time. So I can see all the kind of generations and the kind of genres of how it changed. And you look at the early stages like Kaufman, you know, um, Nicola Dennis, and it was kind of really grimy and aggressive and kitchens were really boisterous and there's a lot of drinking culture and drug culture and smoking and then it kind of went into the Marco era and that was more about rock star status then it went into the Ramsey era which I class as Ramsey as the Beckham era where professional football he started looking at himself Beckham started using gel Chef started using gel all of a sudden they all clean that up going to the gym and then you move into the Heston era where it become very scientific. A lot of people looking at the whole breakdown of, of flavour profiles and what actually is food and how do we create something unique. You can all copy. I think food for me is about a foundation, which is for me, French gastronomy, but also it should equate your travels and your own experience to make your food identifiable to your restaurant. So it's no good me doing a beautiful beef wellington, which is nothing wrong with it, but you can have that probably in lots of other restaurants. What makes you stand out what keeps you awake at night? What makes you want to give your guests something different? What makes you want to give your team a better way of working? So 2015 went to a four day week. We did lots of research into that in terms of looking at the industry and the burnout. Young chefs, social media, 
they are um, very up to date with what's going on. So how do we retain staff? How do we keep staff for two to five years rather than six months to a year, which a lot of chefs in London were doing. So the one way was health insurance, pension, brilliant staff food, four day week, five weeks off a year, Christmas, summer, spring. And don't get me wrong, that one of the worst parts of our industry is the word profit. Yes, we, we're in business and we've got to make money, but what we do is return the profits back as an investment to make the product better and also the staff's working condition. So we close on the 23rd, 24th of December this year. We are a 44-seat restaurant and we open lunches just for the chef's table and kitchen bench from January the 26th when we open, I think. Hopefully the build is finished. We're having a refurbishment. We go down to 36 covers and we don't do lunches anymore. And the reason for that is retention. How do you treat the staff the best? We hired a nutritionist. She works with us on their diet in terms of slow-release carbs. We've worked on a protein bar that we give out at 8 o'clock because that's when energy dips. I've trained all my life, 35 years in the gym. I know about food. I know what it does to you, how it can give you energy and how it can give you some more uh, power when you need it. And also, uh, from a health food group point of view, how to balance a meal that gives people nutrition. And I think that's really crucial for, for thinking ahead of the game. And it's not because we're doing it to lead. We're just doing it because we believe this is right. We should be doing this for our guys and we should be looking after them. We should be looking after the welfare because what we don't want is someone burnt out at 26. I want them to be in the industry a long time, like I've had a brilliant um, industry uh, time and I want people to have a great career travelling once all this COVID stuff it hopefully calms down a bit so that's kind of a bit of a snapshot of who I am and who we are at the restaurant so I understand there might be a few questions is that right that's correct that was really interesting thank you very much I've got I've got a few questions here that I'm okay. going to kick us off with and then I'm going to open to the floor to see if anyone wants to ask any so lots of achievements there sat uh, what would you consider um your greatest achievement I'm still here. <laughs> the, the hardest thing in any industry is relevance. How do you stay relevant? And it's relevance comes from pushing, the fire in the belly, the desire, the will to keep continuing. And I think relevance is the most misunderstood kind of like factor of any restaurant. How do you stay relevant after 23 years? Excellent. Thank you. What are you doing to inspire and encourage our next generation of chefs? You've just talked there about what you're doing to look after the chefs that you've got, but how do you inspire them into the, into the industry? I think, I think it's difficult because <clears throat> you've got young kids and, you know, we're all going to say this and probably said it about my generation and the generation before. You know, social media is, is, is a tool that you can use for good and bad and unfortunately it's one of them things where you look at something and you like it, you want it and you don't want to necessarily earn it. And I think that kind of whole error's gone. So if they've got that, I should have it. But there's a path to get that, and that's called hard work, but that's kind of missing. And I don't want to stand here and preach about the generation of kids, because I've got 14 brilliant chefs at the moment, and each one's very individual, and each one's very, very different in their needs and wants and their aspirations, and I've got to understand all that. And all I can do is work with them. So when I say that, I've got chefs in the kitchen. I don't say you're working for me, I say you're working with me. And I'm there four days a week, so that's all we're open. We're there 47 weeks a year, so I know all their names. I know what they do. I know their career progression with us as an as a individual. And you can see where, like one guy, we had to take off a section last night because he's struggling. And it's not because he's mentally struggling, he just, confidence is low. So what do you do? You, do you then pile on more pressure? Back in the day, yeah, you would. But now we've got to move him into a less stressful situation. He's taken it a bit hard. But you've got to understand that it's his interest at heart. Otherwise, you would just say, grow a pair. Listen, you, you need to pull yourself a socks up. But that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Thank you. Next question um, from, the, from the group. My husband has an anosomia, not from COVID. Um, and although he cannot enjoy the experience of eating... He, can, he cannot enjoy the flavour of food. Therefore, how can I persuade him 
to visit your restaurant and make it worthwhile for both of us? I wouldn't come. <laughs> Simple as that. If you can't taste, got no flavour, why would you waste your money? And that's horrible for him, but well, I'm not going to lie to you, just so I'll take 200 quid off you. Yeah? It's not worth it. Get a curry. Or I guess take Get some... Get Mama Baines's curry, sorry, yeah. Oh. Or I guess take someone else with you, not your yeah, husband. Yeah, take a friend, you know, it's this horrible situation to be in, and, and I feel for him, because flavour is the key to everything. Flavour drives everything, so flavour... It's like if you, if you think of a, a kitchen and you say to you guys, okay, guys, I want, I want a sweet bread, I want a, okay, it's fatty, it's going to be roasted, so it's going to be buttery, it's going to be rich, how do you then you cut it with what? Acidity, wine, vinegar. And all of a sudden the mushroom opens, and okay, if we're going to do that, what we're going to, what's the texture? So it's soft, so you want some contrast. So the contrast could be lentils, it could be cabbage, it could be... So you build a dish, and then that dish has got texture, but flavour is paramount. So without flavour, you're not getting the true ethos of the dish. Excellent, thanks. Um, my next question, I hear you like to do doodles in art school <laughs> and you now do food doodles. What is the tastiest, best doodle you've ever created? <laughs> well, I've not really ate them. But um, doodling with, for me, I'm not a very academic person, so I was really shit at school. So I was always a visual learner. So visual is very important to me. I love art. Art was my first passion. I think I wanted to probably be an artist. So now, really, I've just changed my medium to food. So I look at food as an artistic outcome in terms of my, my, my expression is artistic. So I will see Anish Kapoor's um, mirror at the Playhouse. I'll read upon him. I'll see some abstract art that's kind of red. <clears throat> and then we do a beef tartare with a red sheet of beetroot jelly. And it looks just like an Ishka Paul. You dust it with some beetroot powder. You serve the picture first to the guest and you say, this is inspired by an Ishka Paul. The connection is there's a sky mirror at the playhouse. So that makes a lot of sense to me. So that's a very unique way of thinking in terms of artistic approach. So there's lots of, I've done thousands of doodles. I've got loads of books full and I, I still do them today. So I don't know the best one, but um, it's a constant. OK, I'm going to ask a question now, and then if anyone wants to put their hand up, if they've got a question, I'll come to you. So um, what do you believe the government should do to improve training and rewards in the public catering sector? <clears throat> I don't know. <clears throat> I really don't know. I think when I was at college, you know, we used to actually touch fish and meat and produce. And I remember speaking to a lecturer a few years ago, and they did a video on how to prep lobster like a video. They didn't even see the, the lobster. And that's because the funding's so low and they couldn't afford it. But how are you supposed to teach these young kids about food? You know, we cooked in a city and guild 76, one and two. Every day was in the kitchen and you had to do theory. But every day, we'd, every Friday we did butchery. We'd get a whole carcass, butcher it down, have a little shop. All the, the teachers from the university, from the Wilmington College would come to the counter would bag it up, would serve them as, as if it was a real shop, but we prepped the whole beast. But when was the last time a kid at you know, Nottingham, Mansfield or Derby College did that? I don't know. So I don't, I don't know the answer. I think for us, I don't look at academia in terms of if I'm going to employ a chef. We get them in for a trial. They do three, four hours in the kitchen to see what we're like. They get to realise the produce we use. And then we say to them, OK, go to the fridge, go to the garden. You've got two and a half hours to produce two courses from half an hour's time. <clears throat> and that way, they're utilising produce that they've seen in the fridge. They're going to cook something and you can taste it. And you can tell if they've got skills or not just by that small exercise. OK, thank you. Um, questions from the floor? Anyone? Good morning. Um, do you still have a five or ten year plan that you're working towards? And if so, what is it? The problem is as you get older, it has to be like a two and a three year plan, I think. <laughs> now, the five year plan for me is I've got ten more years left at the restaurant in terms of it's a long lease. So we've got a big refurbishment happening this year and next year. 
And that will be probably be the last refurbishment we do because it's going to change the dynamics of what we do at the restaurant. But it's that eagerness to... Almost like, you know, back in the day when I said about the work ethic, I think there's something really satisfying about doing a day's work. So I still want that fulfilment of doing a day's work because I think it keeps your mind active and it keeps you younger with having a big, a big team of... We've got 44 staff at the restaurant... And you, you learn so much from them as well, but it keeps you active. So that the next plan is to keep evolving the product in terms of the food, the service, the wine, the bedrooms. And it's a constant drive that doesn't let you sleep. And I think as long as I've got that, and there's a, there's a couple of things, we, me and Amanda would love to do something in Australia. We love Australia in Melbourne, and it's something once uh, we can travel. We've got people out there, uh, friends and ex-chefs that used to work for me, that are established out there. So that would be fantastic. Like, you know, like Del Boy's Dream, you know, um, Lenten, what was it? Knightsbridge with uh, Tom Kerridge's Smosers now, because my mum's got Smosers there. And Melbourne, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Have it on a van. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? I've been sat on teams for 18 months. I've got to make my way around the room. Thank you. Hi, Sat. Hi. Um, you talk about retention within your team, which is uh, fantastic, especially the four-day week. I can see that happening a lot across the industry. What do you personally think about the chef crisis? Because there is a chef crisis and there was a chef crisis before the pandemic and before Brexit. And also, what do you think about apprenticeships? Um, I think the chef crisis is, is here to stay. I don't think young kids want to go into a, a restaurant. I don't think they want to... You know, for every successful chef we've had through the door, there's probably seven to eight that haven't made it. And that's massive. But, you know, we are at the extreme level of cooking in terms of the Michelin star level. So you ask a lot of people. You ask a lot of them. They ask a lot of themselves. And some people haven't got it. And there's nothing wrong with failure. A failure should be accepted as a, as a positive. You know, I look at dishes that have failed and I think, okay, we can learn from that. But not everyone... I, I used to think when I was a kid, everyone's got the possibility to be amazing. But they have, but not necessarily in the field they chose. They might have to look at something else. So I was a, I was a dreamer. I, you know, like, remember Ratatouille when he goes, everybody's got the... You know, everyone can be amazing. But, but they can, but not necessarily always in... Fine dining or football. How many footballers don't make it to the Premiership? That are brilliant. It's exactly the same. So the crisis is people want, but they haven't got, got the skills, mindset, drive. I, I want, you know, I want a Ferrari. I, I don't want a Ferrari. I think that's shit. But I'd like a Lamborghini Urus, like a four by four. But I've got to earn it. I'm not going to get it through an advertising deal because it's fake. And I'd rather work and earn it, so I've paid for it. But that's the very old school mentality because it's an old school ethic that I was taught from a young age. But you get a kid now that says, oh my God, I want to go on. Like Liam, I don't know if you've been watching MasterChef, one of our lads in, in the final. And um, he's, he's driven. He started cooking at 13 for his dad. His dad kicked the shit out of him for five years. And he became this incredibly talented young chef. Worked at Glen Eagles with Andrew Fairley for three years. Worked for us for three years. Now he's killing it on a TV programme. But... My first thought was, don't do it. But he wants success. He wants the product. He wants the advertising. He wants the collaboration dinners. He wants the money. I can't stop him doing that. So he, he left because I can't allow him to take Saturdays off to do dinner parties for five grand. So I said, you need to go so you can earn that kind of money. But he's 24. So what's going to be him at 30 when he's already had this massive success? I don't know the future for him, but he's very talented. So is he going to jump five years ahead, grab the money now, or is he going to have a slow, amazingly long career? I don't know the answer. Why can't he do both? Apprenticeships, I think, they're great. I think they are very, very good, as long as you get the support. Because ultimately, we've got to then take on someone that's coming in quite green, wants to be a chef or a waiter or a sommelier, and we've got to put the time to that as well. You know, going back to what we said before, academia for me was never a strong point. So I don't look at academia as 
someone coming in with a degree in hospitality. That doesn't mean nothing to me. Let's see how you interact with the customer. Let's see how you work in a team. That tells me a lot more. Any other questions from the floor? Hi, Sat. Hi. Um, what's your view on the role of plant-based and vegan eating in the context of um, sustainability and sustainable gastronomy, particularly at um, a fine dining level? I think there's nothing wrong with it, but it's your choice. Personally, I said a few years ago, and I mean this today, our menu is £195 a head. And if you're a vegan, and I gave you a menu £195 a head, I think it's a rip-off. So I can't do that for you. So I said, when I'm giving someone that eats protein, beautiful turbot, caviar, the best protein you can get on the market, wild game, I can't justify having a vegan menu at the same price. Oh, so why don't you make the menu cheaper? Can't. Business. That chair equals, what, 100,000 a year? In a restaurant, just for example. How can I make that earn 70,000 a year? Because I've done a reduced menu for a vegan. My mum's food is vegan. Mama Baines is vegan. So I'm not anti-vegan, I love vegan food. But as a business model in a restaurant, at what we do, a 35, 40 seat restaurant, to do a vegan menu, <clears throat> to charge you that, I can't justify it. So that was me being very, very honest, saying, guys, I think it's a rip-off. But everyone just kicked up a storm, oh, he's anti-vegan. No, <laughs> just listen to what I said. I'm telling you I don't want your money because I'm ripping you off at £195 to do your vegan menu. But people don't get it. Oh, he's anti oh, Fine, if that's what you think, fine. But how you can't be any more honest than that or transparent. Yes, Daniel Hume wants to go plant-based, which is fantastic. And he is a three-star chef and he is world-class. And he's, I've, known, I've known Daniel 10 years and he's a phenomenal cook. But that's his choice. If he's going to put all that effort that he puts into all his other menus and do a vegan menu, it's going to cost you 400 quid, it's probably worth it. But not for the 2% we would do or the 1% we would do. So that's the way he's gone to choo choose to go. But obviously it didn't work for Claridge's, hence the parted ways. I'm going to ask you another question of the ones we had in advance. Um, what's your view on what a typical menu would look like in five or ten years' time? <laughs> I think sourcing's crucial. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate to have some of the best suppliers in the UK. And um, you get to know them, you have a relationship with them, and they also... We've got gardeners at the restaurant that will grow very specific herbs for us. So, yes, I think there's going to be a move towards... There has been a massive shift towards plant-based foods, but just because it's plant-based, you know, you've got to read through all the lines and, like, how much does it cost, like, agriculture and how much does it cost... Like, you know, who was talking the other day? Someone said that the reason... If you go to a, a forest, do you ever smell really bad shit coming from deers? No. And why is that? Because they're not fed artificial food so that's why the methane problem is so bad and that's why this problem with the whole world is so bad at the moment with the methane gases because we're feeding food to animals especially the big cattle foods they wouldn't normally eat so they're creating a lot of methane so when was the last time you went to a kind of like a wild part of somewhere where they got lovely llamas they don't smell so there's lots of issues there that what what are we actually what are we listening to? And there's two sides to every story. And as a chef, I have a responsibility to source brilliant food. That's If it's not wild, it's well sourced. We have only got game on at the moment because it's game season in the UK. But guess what? There's anti-game lobby now, which is now you're, you're going to get in trouble for serving game. I go shooting. I go shooting five, six times a year. I take the birds back. At the moment, we've got mallard from Ludlow. That's on the menu. I shot that bird, and it's on the menu. So that's the, the train, of the, the chain effect of where it's come from. You're being transparent, you're being honest. Game is a British institution, and it's not all about, you know, got, you know posh guys in the countryside and the aristocracy. It's about, I know that if I went on a game shoot, that I'm going to take as many of them birds back with me as so are the other guys that are on the shoot, because they're all chefs. 
When you hear about these game shoots where they've shot 3,000 birds and they get a bulldozer and they bury the birds, that's when you've got to think, hey, what's going on here? And I, and I disagree with that. But I, that's why when I got involved in shooting about seven, eight years ago, I wanted to know where the birds were going. And the trouble is, the public don't want to eat game. They don't want to eat game at home because they don't know how to prepare it. Because it's lean, gets tough very quickly. People don't know how to cook a good pheasant, a good partridge, because it's alien to them. But there's millions of these birds out there. So it's our job as chefs to educate, to say, guys, grass season, you've got to eat some grass. So on the same vein, on that question, um, what's the decision-making process for new dishes, making it onto the menu? And what dishes should we look out for in 2022? <laughs> I think we always have like five or six dishes that are rolling, that are always in development. And again, because we only do, I think we do 10 dishes, 10, 11 dishes. So you're trying to look for contrast and balance. So say for example, you had your first course was a smoked eel and that's got kind of smokiness. It's got truffle, so it's earthy. And then you want to go for something what, that's quite soft. There's some texture in it from the bread, but then you want to move into something that's kind of hot. So you've got the contrast of temperature. And that could be potatoes cooked on the wood fire. So you've got that charred element with some caviar, so that's salty. And then what you do, you just plot each stage of the menu. So it's not an individual dish, it's part of a larger sequence. So I did some research um, years ago on things like, you know, when you go to see a musical or a concert or an album. So how do people make these songs and how do you keep someone's attention for two and a half hours? And especially in a, in a tasting menu format. So you've got to have contrast to this thing called a Freytag pyramid, which gives you like an introduction to the characters. It's got a plot, it's got a crescendo, it's got a finish, like a finale, a conclusion. So I use that as a plot to devise a menu. And it, for me, because it's probably artistic, it makes a lot of sense. So the Freytag pyramid, for me, makes a lot of sense of putting dishes in a sequential order to give you contrast and little hits and keep you excited because if you think about food as in you normally get bored after two or three mouthfuls your brain slowly switches off so if you've got a soup for example you got tomato soup you went two spoons you're hungry oh my god that's delicious after the fourth fifth sixth mouthful it, it dulls and the reason is because you got used to it but then you had croutons all of a sudden you get texture it spikes your interest again so then you are interested in the dish again so that's what we've got to do you play with the ceramics you play with the weight of the plate. You play with the texture. So all these things, the visuals, the colour. So it's a massive thing to create a, a kind of menu that you're constantly working on. Thank you. This is my last question, okay. just to keep us on time. Um, what are your views on social media, for chefs in particular, and which platform has the greatest influence for you? I think, you know, social media is fantastic. You know, back in the day when I was younger, you, you'd had to go to the restaurant. You had to go to the restaurant to see the food, read the menu, or write to them and ask them for a menu. But you didn't see any visuals. You didn't know what kind of food. Now, you've, from your phone, you can travel the world in five minutes and see what everyone's doing. It's fascinating. But it's also, I don't know, I'm, I'm not anti-social um, media. I think I use Instagram a lot because, for me, Instagram's easy. It, you can put stuff out there quickly and 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 um, I was trying to put the creative process on there and any inspiration I've had or anything, anything, it's a bit, bit rubbish. So if you do see my Instagram, it's not managed, it's by me, to my wife's avail, get someone to look at that. No, I think it's genuine, it's me, so if I, uh, I can only apologise for what's on there. But, uh, but I think it's a great tool and I think um, the only downside, like I said earlier, is, is these really talented young chefs um, wanting things that they haven't earned yet. And I think there's nothing wrong with aspiration and goals and, and being driven. But you've got to like think, you know, how, how am I going to get that? Well, you've got to work for it. But that's my view. I don't, I don't know if that's old, you know, but it's just the review I've got from, from years of being in the trade. Thank you very much. I, I think it's been absolutely fascinating to hear your story. Um, I'd like to ask everyone if they could put their hands together and, uh, thank and thanks for that.